Okay, welcome everyone. It's so great to have you here on our exclusive live webinar event, Lead the Field, How to Become an Authority in Healthcare or a Healthcare Authority. I'm your host, Justin Bass, and I'm going to be joined here shortly by Rusty Shelton, my co-host, and we are beyond excited to have you guys on the call today. This is really a transformational time in, in healthcare in our country, and it's time that we really focus on how to build healthcare authorities who are going to transform, change, and disrupt the healthcare for the positive. And this webinar is designed to do just that, to give you the information that you need to become that true authority in healthcare. Well, as your host, Justin Bass, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on myself. So I'm the chair of the health practice at Advantage Media and Forbes Books. I have the distinct honor of working with healthcare uh, innovators, leaders, disruptors every day. And in doing so, my mission is really to transform healthcare through authorship and authority marketing. And I have a background in healthcare. I've spent about 14 years across the biopharma industry in a variety of roles, working in population health management, health IT, uh, care process redesign, disease management, and I've also consulted for a few biotech startups in the mobile tech space. So I've had my hands in healthcare for a long time and spent a lot of that time focused on patient behavior change and physician behavior change. And so that's what, what I'm here to do today is maybe change some of your perspectives on what is an authority in the marketplace. And I'm joined by our co-host, Rusty Shelton. Rusty, are you on the line? I am, Justin. Glad to be here. Thanks, Rusty. It's great to have you. Well, well, folks, if you don't know Rusty Shelton, then you should, because not only is he the senior marketing strategist at Advantage Media and Forbes Books with us here, but Rusty is a prolific author and speaker uh, in the healthcare space and beyond. He's worked with some major brands like Sully Sullenberger, of course, we all know that it saved the flight landing on the Hudson and um, Sally Hogshead and Jack Canfield from Chicken Soup for the Soul and, and many others. And Rusty's really a, a brand manager, brand strategist, and knows a lot about this new media economy. Specifically for healthcare, Rusty is the author of the Mastering the New Media Landscape. And that book, um, not only in healthcare, but beyond, transcends the, the media, new media landscape we're all operating in and how to, to really master that. And then Rusty also speaks prolifically across the country. He's not only at the Harvard Medical School um, continuing education course where they focus on publishing and social media, he's got a couple of keynotes across the country for other healthcare conferences coming up. So look for Rusty on his speaking tour. And Rusty, we're glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, Justin. As you mentioned, I think there's more opportunity today than ever before in the health space to not only get out there and build a great audience, build authority, but also to, to really make an impact uh, beyond your practice. So really excited to, to dig into that with you. Thanks, Rusty. Well, let's dive in, folks. Since we've got you on the line and we've got the time here at hand, let's look at what we're going to cover today. We really have a, a broad outline that we're going to focus on. So we've got what authority marketing is, the reasons for examples of and the outcomes of authority marketing. What are those core pillars of authority marketing? And then Rusty's going to take us into understanding the changing media environment and how we're going to succeed in this new media landscape. He'll give you a 10-step plan for growing your authority platform. And by the end, you should be able to conduct an online brand audit and better shape your online platform. You should also be positioned to garner media attention through social media as early as next week, if not tomorrow after watching this. And then you're going to have a specific plan to grow your email list, that owned media space, and, and really grow your authority brand further. And then finally, we'll wrap up with how exactly do you do this? How do you build your authority marketing plan for, your, for yourself, your practice, and your business? Well, first, let's start with what is authority. Authority is the strategic process of systematically positioning a person or an organization as the leader and expert in their industry, community, or marketplace to command outsized influence among all competitors. And that's what we're here to do today, is to take that definition, to be strategic, and to provide you all with a roadmap for how to become that authority in healthcare. 
when you think about an authority, there's other words that, that maybe go along with that that society uses. Certainly we have the authority, but then there's also celebrity. Sometimes people connotate that with a negative view of, of someone being a celebrity. But if you think about it, what's wrong with being a celebrity in healthcare? As long as you've got good motives and you're aligned with improving patient care at a higher quality, at a lower cost, and giving better access and more transparency to patients, then is it wrong to be a celebrity in healthcare? And then the more common term is expert, right? We think about the folks that have published peer-reviewed journals, done bodies of research and work, had many, many procedures or hours as a, as a physician in the field that the context them being an expert. Really, these three things go together, and comprehensively, that's what defines a healthcare authority in this new media landscape. Well, there's a huge secret about authority that I need to tell you about. You may know this, you may not, but people buy from people. People don't buy products, people don't buy services, they don't buy companies, they buy from people. And when you think about a patient going into a practice, they're gonna go see their doctor. They have a doctor. They go into a hospital system, they're gonna eventually have a doctor or a nurse. They buy from people. They're served by people. People also assign an irrational amount of authority to someone who is the author of a book. And if you think about that, when you watch a, a late night talk show or you're looking at uh, interviews that are in print media, oftentimes the person that's being interviewed is the author of a book. And why? Because people buy irrationally, they buy from people, and they view people with the book as an authority. And it wasn't by coincidence that I put the 1895 version of the British Medical Journal down there on the right hand side. And that's simply to say that, look, in healthcare, and we'll, we'll unpack this further in a few minutes, in healthcare, it's really important to have research and have the peer reviewed medical journals that drive the industry forward. But if that's all we're doing is communicating through those, those, those outdated channels when it comes to our new media landscape and those niche channels that don't go beyond healthcare then we're missing this much broader audience the chance to really make the impact in healthcare that we need to make. So it starts with the book. And we'll unpack why a book is so powerful in building your authority. So there's a couple of reasons for authority marketing. The first is to become known, recognized and respected as a true authority on a few high value kinds of expertise to a very niche audience, whether that's employers or patients or other providers or a major health system or a PBM or the government or the consumer population. And to have the, the reason, the willingness and the ability for that population to pay well for that expertise. And certainly when you think about paying well, and we've got a lot of changes happening in healthcare with reimbursement and the shift from volume to value. So as we make that value shift, wouldn't it be really important to be recognized as an authority, someone that has the ability to drive those outcomes, that's proven that, but also is viewed in the eyes of the population that they're trying to appeal, you, appeal to in a way that makes sense? And I really think about the, the bundled payment model that's out there right now is a great example of this. And if you've got a, an orthopedic organization, for example, who can convey that they have the true authority in the space of orthopedics, they're recognized not only in the healthcare space, but outside of that space, they've got a book, they've got other platforms that, that really showcase them as that, that capacity, then they're much more likely to be able to engage an employer in a bundled model around joint replacement and create that contractual relationship in an effective manner. The second reason for authority marketing is to be the, the go-to guy or gal for something of high value. You want to be that person that everybody prefers if they can afford to come to you for your, your product or your service. And in healthcare, this is really creating that, that niche space where um, we, I know of a, an orthopedic surgeon, continuing with that example, he's a, a foot surgeon. And he's got a six to eight month wait list. And think about that for a second. These are people who 
it's not like it's it's a part of your body that you you can really get around. These are people that are wearing moon boots or in wheelchairs or other forms for months until they can come see him because he is a world-renowned authority in the space. He's got the outcomes. He's taking care of professional athletes and, and other famous people, but he's also put himself out there in a way that the market beyond just his peers in orthopedics can see himself as an authority. And he's now created this persona that he's the go-to person and his outcomes back it up. Thirdly, you want to be that person of influence that others want to stand next to. You want to be the person on the stage at the next big healthcare conference. You want to be the person speaking outside of healthcare to large employer groups or advocacy groups or speaking to the media and being recognized as, as that, that authority. And fourth, it's really about leveraging the authority for autonomy. And this is again about that standalone principle. And when you have authority, you can really transcend an industry. You can transcend a marketplace. You can transcend the challenges that, that may arise within healthcare today. And those four reasons are, are really why it's important to focus on authority marketing as a plan to build a true healthcare authority. So think on this for a minute. If we look at the shift in the paradigm of becoming a healthcare authority, I speak with a lot of people on this topic and many times they come back and say, Justin, you know, look, being an authority in healthcare, you're just sensationalizing something that you're trying to, you know, Kardashianize becoming an authority. And, and I think that it's about vanity and conceit and, and let me tell you, that's dead wrong. That's not what becoming an authority is about in healthcare. It's really about the fact that you're trying to appeal to the population that you're trying to serve, whether it be patients or employers or the government or other providers. And it's really about putting yourself out there in a way and in, in providing the type of media, which for us to talk about shortly, that people want to consume in the way they want to consume it and the vehicles that they are consuming it by. And, you know, a real world example that I'll give is, who would a patient choose? Let's say the physician on the left in the, in the white coat is a Harvard trained, 150 peer reviewed journal, thousands of procedural hours cardiologist who has clearly expertise in the area, but no one knows about him outside of the Harvard system or his peers versus Dr. Oz, who's a cardiologist who's all over Oprah and every major media outlet across the country and most household, most people as a household name know Dr. Oz. And I would contend that people are going to choose Dr. Oz. Patients will choose Dr. Oz for their cardiovascular care. Why? Because he's positioned himself as an authority in the healthcare space using the new media economy. And that's what it's really about. There are going to be more physicians, whether you like Dr. Oz or not, whether he's qualified or not, who are going to rise to positions of authority in healthcare. And they're gonna have tremendous amounts of influence over the healthcare ecosystem. And I pose a choice and a challenge to you. Do you wanna be one of those authorities? Are you a true healthcare innovator, disruptor, transform it, transformational figure who is doing the right thing for patients and for, for healthcare? Then why not become that authority and change the healthcare ecosystem that we operate in? And, and, you know, this is a big point because when you think about the paradigm shift, part of this goes back to the healthcare ecosystem continues to expand. There are new players entering the system every day. Look at the blue bubble down on the left around technology. I mean, Amazon and Apple and Google and all the major IBM, Microsoft, they're all entering this space and making major plays in healthcare. You know, artificial intelligence and all the startups that are coming now flooding into healthcare because there's so many dollars available in healthcare, those people are all positioning themselves as authority and they've got an outsized authority in another industry that they're bringing into healthcare. We need healthcare leaders to rise up from within the industry and really make themselves appealing to this whole ecosystem and not just within their peer groups. You know, another area I want to point out is up there in that, that purple bubble and it's around venture capital, private equity and crowdfunding. For those of you that aren't familiar with crowdfunding, it's a huge opportunity where non-accredited investors can invest in some really cool concepts like health IT startups, like physician organizations, 
to help them get off the ground. And so if I'm a physician group or I'm, I'm a health IT startup and I want to appeal to that to the broader masses through crowdfunding, it's important that I have a, a brand and a brand image and that brand on their presence that just transcends healthcare again. And finally, that, that yellow bubble down on the right, again, is you know, those employer groups, they are ripe right now for collaboration and partnership and they want to work with healthcare authorities. And the best way to do that is to put yourself out there in a media in a way that they can understand and consume that. So let's walk through an example of a healthcare authority. Dr. Stephen Hotze is a physician that uh, we've worked with here for, for years. And Dr. Hotze is the pinnacle example of a, not only being a, a physician who's a, an incredible teacher, but he's also a great student. And he took to heart everything that we showed him around becoming a healthcare authority. And as you can see here from Dr. Hotze's personal brand website, um, he has done a great job of being featured across many media outlets. He's positioned himself as an authority, and that's translated into some incredible results for himself, his practice, and his patients. So Dr. Hosey's authored two books, Hormones, Health, and Happiness, and Hypothyroidism, Health, and Happiness. He has, uh, again, right place, right time, right, right concept, sold over 60,000 copies of Hypothyroidism, or Hormones, Health, and Happiness, I'm sorry, excuse me. And, you know, that's a lot of books. And, you know, that's a, an incredible accomplishment in and of himself. But beyond just the book sales, Dr. Hotze's used this book to gain an endorsement from Suzanne Summers. He's leveraged it to be on numerous television and PR outlets in both print media, television, and radio. And you saw some of those on his website. He's been in magazine ads in Spirit Magazine. He's got a weekly radio show that he actually is the creates the content for and owns that content and again Russ will talk about what owned media means here in a bit. He's also got an H magazine that he puts out again more owned media content a great way to stay in touch with his constituents and at least two times a year he's doing these incredible guest events where he takes his book and he will send it out around Christmas time to any patient that wants to send it to a family member a friend a, a hairstylist and whoever that, that may be that may be the right type of patient for Dr. Hosey's practice, they'll send a book to him for free with a handwritten note from the person that sent it to him. He does thousands of those a year and gains hundreds of new patients for his practice every single year by focusing on that. So Dr. Hosey clearly has made himself an authority. And look at these financial results. I mean, at the end of the day, patient care is, is critical, but if you, you're not, you got to stay in business at the same time. And before Dr. Hotze really became an authority, he had about 12 employees and was doing $2.4 million a year. That would be you know, an average specialty private practice in our country. Now, this number is, is even bigger than what's shown here, but he's got over 100 employees. He's doing upwards of, at this point, it's $25 million a year. He's got multiple practices. And let me tell you the, the most interesting piece about this whole story. Dr. Hotze hasn't seen patients in a couple of years. He's the CEO of his company. He's handling the media, the marketing, and driving the company forward in new and innovative ways. Yet every patient that comes to his practice and sees another provider, if you were to ask them and say, who's your doctor? They would say Dr. Stephen Hotze. Now that is being a healthcare authority. Here's just some examples of Dr. Hotze again, being featured in the media. Well, there's two really big outcomes of authority. The first outcome is credibility. And, and look, when's the last time a patient walked into a doctor's office, looked on the wall and said, you know what, I came to see you because of where you had your, your degree from. You know, I don't see that happening that much, if at all. And in, in healthcare, outcomes are critical. And as transparency increases, it's gonna be critical that you provide high quality at a low cost, and that's on par with the market. And the outcomes are there to, to match that. Well, credibility is what really dictates that in healthcare. And what we see as you build healthcare authority is that you're authoring your own content. You're gaining media appearances, and you have a tribe 
that translates into super credibility and you've leveraged those past achievements, awards, designations, and those peer-reviewed journals, and over time, you've increased your credibility, but if you've leveraged authority marketing, you get super credibility, and you have outsized influence in the marketplace, and that's what we wanna see happen for our authors, the folks that we work with, who become healthcare authorities. So that's one. The second one is trust. Credibility and trust. The acceleration of trust happens when you build an authority platform through authority marketing. There's a book that was written several years ago by Dan Kennedy, another one of our members, and Matt Zagula, another, another author and member that we've worked with. And this book really shows how creating trust is the one thing that changes everything. And I think in healthcare, as we look at the state that we're in, there's a lot of distrust. There's distrust in the government, there's distrust in potentially the providers and the, the large health systems and the payers. There's, there's a lack of trust in our country in general, but in healthcare, I think it's even more magnified. And so when you become an authority, you put yourself in a position of creating that acceleration of trust with your patients, with the employers, with the consumers, whoever you're serving in healthcare. And credibility and trust are two things that we see as the biggest byproducts and outcomes of becoming a healthcare authority. Well, lastly, as we, we think about this concept of authority in healthcare, what really defines that? And, you know, if you look at, at the traits of a healthcare authority, Rusty is gonna really unpack these, these seven traits or seven pillars, if you will, even further here in just a minute. But, it really comes down to the fact that are you rising to an authority status with the population that matters to you? And, and are you appealing to them in a way and providing content in a way that they can absorb it, they can digest it, and that matters to them? And the way that we see seven pillars to build the foundation for becoming an authority in healthcare starts with your branding and your omnipresence. You know, you are who Google says you are. Content strategy. Are you consistently putting out a, a content strategy that's original, that's evergreen, that ties into that, that broader marketing strategy and has social media as a part of it? Are you generating leads and using a lead magnet to do so? Are you focused on publicity and media, building that tribe through other sources, taking advantage of the opportunity to be as seen on or as heard on really great media outlets? Do you have a referral network that you're building? Word of mouth is so critical in healthcare, and if you're an authority, you have an even outsized ability to do that. And are you generating referrals and, and managing that process in an effective way? Are you speaking, not just within healthcare, but outside of healthcare, and to patient populations, to employer groups, to your peers in healthcare, and are you doing that regularly? And lastly, are you hosting events annually to connect with the folks in, in healthcare? And we feel like if you do those seven things and you do those seven things well, and if you position the book as the foundation of all of that, then you can become a true healthcare authority. So with that, I'm going to transition over to Rusty and let him really walk you through mastering the new media landscape and his 10 step plan for growing your authority brand. So Rusty, we take it away. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I think it was really helpful to run through just big picture. What is an authority, but, but why does it matter so much today in a, in a space as crowded as healthcare with, with as many, um, you know, different competing messages and, and competing agendas? Why does it matter more than ever to go beyond the practice and, and really build authority outside of the day-to-day -day, uh, patients that you're, that you're seeing? And so uh, what I want to talk through now that you've kind of set the stage with the big picture around authority marketing in the healthcare space, very practically, what does this look like? How, how do you step-by-step -step start growing your authority platform, uh, as we call it? And so um, for me, the first step here is really taking a step back um, in under, understanding the changing media environment. I, I remember back when I started my career, I uh, came out of the University of Texas in 2003. My first job was as a book publicist. Um, and in that previous media environment, I remember my first day when I walked in uh, on the desk, I had eight books stacked up. I had a telephone to the right of those eight books, and I had a three-ring binder to the left of them. And my job was to pick up the phone 
to go through that three ring binder to find a producer's name and phone number, pick up the phone, cold call them and try to talk them into having one of our authors on the air. Or, or if I'm talking to a journalist, convince them to write an article uh, about that author. And so in that previous media environment, uh, there were really only two ways to get a message out at scale. You could either buy your way onto somebody's platform by renting it, or you could earn your way onto somebody's platform by getting an interview or getting a speaking engagement or getting featured in the newspaper. But, but Justin, you know, in that, in that previous environment, the only way to get a message out was to go through the media because they controlled the, the essentially had a stranglehold on distribution. So all the power rested in those newsrooms of traditional media outlets. And whether you had a book that you were promoting or whether you were a thought leader in the healthcare space looking to, to get an idea out or um, looking to, to really shift uh, the public's perception of a certain disease or certain treatment, if you didn't make it through that gatekeeper, there was no way to get a message out at scale. Um, so in the publishing space, uh, at that time, there was also a real heavy reliance on the 30-day window after a book came out, uh, because in that previous environment, we were relying on bookstores to push books out, and Barnes and Noble had it on the front, you know, front table for 30 days after the book came out, and if you didn't move it off the table in that time, the book was coming back. So the the long story short on that is, in that previous media environment, again, there were gatekeepers, and you had to go through the media to get to your audience. Um, so if you fast forward to, to where we are today, number one, the media has changed dramatically. Um, so there's a stat that I still use because I think it's so jarring, uh, because in the years 2000 and 2008, between that time, one in four media jobs disappeared. And if you think about that time frame, 2008 is the front end of the Great Recession. Um, most people put that number well past half right now. And so if you think about that media environment, the remaining what we might think of as traditional media or legacy media, you've got fewer and fewer journalists in the newsroom that are now tasked with covering more stories than ever before. Not only do they have to fill up the magazine or the newspaper, they've got to fill up the website. They've got to push out blogs. They've got to get a newsletter out. And so for a lot of them, the last thing that they have time for is to sit back and wait to be pitched. So increasingly, what we're seeing from the media is um, really an increasing interest in connecting directly with healthcare experts, healthcare authorities online. So in other words, when they need an expert for a story, what we're seeing more and more is them proactively pursuing that expert. So one of the things that uh, George Washington University Incision did a survey of journalists just to look at this, how have things changed? Uh, and they said, when you're researching a story, what do you do? Uh, and 89% of those journalists said that they head online. They look to blogs. Many more look to social networking sites. And so one of the biggest things that we're seeing for healthcare professionals right now is that this old model of just sitting back and, and kind of hoping that, uh, you know, that, that the media finds you. Now what you've got to do, there's very specific things that you can do to widen your net to catch that media attention online. So if you look at where we are today, uh, in, in the current media landscape, we're really right now at a point where you have more control than ever before uh, to build your platform. So with fewer and fewer traditional media targets, what we're finding from the public right now is this shift from focusing just on large generic media. And increasingly, what we're doing is moving away from that and moving more towards what we call micromedia. Uh, so for example, I used to drive into the office, I had about a 45 minute drive to work and I used to listen to NPR each day. And in a 45 minute drive when I'm listening to NPR, maybe I get three segments that I'm really interested in. So over the course of that 45 minutes, you know, maybe I've got 10 minutes or 12 minutes that really piques my interest. So increasingly what I'm doing is I'm now turning off NPR and instead I'm downloading a podcast it gives me 45 minutes entirely of, of, of content that I'm interested in myself. And so one of the cool things about that, as you're listening to this, is in today's media landscape, we call it the age of micromedia. In today's media landscape, every individual, every brand, whether they know it or not, is a media outlet. Okay, some people are influencing a couple of hundred people online, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. Um, some brands that have really taken this seriously, some individual health authorities who have taken this seriously, have a, have a newsletter that's going out to tens of thousands of people, have a podcast that reaches thousands of people every week. 
And so one of the big things that Justin and I want to encourage you to think about today is this opportunity you have to really think like a media outlet and embrace the opportunity to start reaching an audience at scale. Okay. And the best way to reach an audience at scale is not to market to them. It's not to push ads at them. It's not to to try to sell anything, as Justin mentioned earlier, authority is not about ego. It's not about being famous. What it's really about is entertaining and informing an audience. It, it, it's about giving them content that they're interested in, in the same way that major media gives them content uh, through the newspaper or through a magazine. So one of the big things that I want you to think about in this shift, and this is really a graphic that we often use uh, to explain this, but really in today's media landscape, we've got three categories of media. Okay, if you think back to that previous landscape that I talked about before, it was really a 2D environment. In other words, to get a message out at scale 10 years ago, you either had to rent media, in other words, you had to buy an ad, or you had to earn your way onto local radio or local newspaper or, or a national opportunity. And so if you fast forward to where we are today, we still have both of those categories, but the biggest game changer, the biggest opportunity that we see uh, in the healthcare space is the opportunity to uh, to grow the size of your own media. So let, let's quickly unpack each of these before we transition to the next section here. Um, so rented media. Rented media, the obvious of what's included in the rented media category is advertising. Uh, but the second key thing that's included in that category is social media, okay? So your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook page, your Twitter account, Instagram, et cetera, wherever you may be in social media, that lives in that category. And, and the way we define the rented media category is it's, it's a category of media where you fully control the content, but you don't own the real estate, okay? So if you think about an advertisement, you control every piece of text in that ad, whether it goes out in a newspaper, whether someone's reading it on the radio. You control the content, but you don't actually own that real estate, right? You don't own the audience. The whole point that you have to buy an ad there is to reach an audience that someone else has built, okay? The other big thing about rented media is the audience understands that anyone can do it. There's a low barrier to entry. So when you buy an ad, and when we're reading the newspaper, the way we view the authority of someone who has an advertisement is incredibly different from the person who's featured right next to it in an article, the person that's interviewed there. And that's because we don't assign a whole lot of authority in that rented media category. Um, the second big thing in that rented media category, again, social media channels, your Facebook page, your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter account, incredibly important to building authority, especially in the healthcare space. Twitter has grown dramatically in terms of its impact, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But rented media, the longer you leave your audience on real estate you don't own, whether that's your practice's Facebook page, whether that's your own LinkedIn profile, the big thing to think about there is the longer you leave your audience there, the more beholden you are um, to their willingness to let you get to that audience without paying for it. The second category is earned media. So earned media is uh, is nothing new. Um, and I, when, when I talk with a lot of healthcare providers, a lot of healthcare experts, this is really the category they're most interested in, most of them. Okay, so earned media includes all of the stages you've got to earn your way onto. Okay, so that includes publicity, it includes speaking engagements, it includes peer-reviewed journals, it includes a book, it includes word of mouth, online reviews. So earned media, by definition, is a message that goes out on real estate you don't own, and it's a message that you have to earn, okay? And by the way, earned media can be positive, it can also be negative, okay? But nothing provides more authority to you than earned media. The limiting factor though on earned media and the reason that I cringe when I see a healthcare expert put all of their eggs in this basket is there's no long-term leverage with it. In other words, for a message to go out on earned media, we've got to rely on somebody else to do something. So that patient has to make that referral. That journalist has to say yes to writing about you. That meeting planner has to put you on stage for that keynote. And so the challenge with earned media is it's so important early on to build your authority with, but there's no long-term leverage because we don't own the audience, all right? Which leads us into the last category, owned media. So owned media includes all of the assets, all of the media where you own the connection to your audience, okay? So owned media includes your website. It includes your blog, if it lives on your website, your email list, 
as well as the physical mailing list. The great opportunity that we have with owned media is the opportunity, again, to think like a media outlet, okay? And what I, when I say that, what I really mean there is in the age of micromedia, the biggest opportunity we have in the health space is to start to build an audience that looks to you in your subcategory, whatever your specialty area may be, whether it's cardiology or neuroscience or uh, or, or another area where they look to you as the most entertaining and informative source of information. That could be on your blog, it could be on your podcast, it could be in your newsletter. But when you own the connection to that audience, you own the ability to reach them anytime you want. The way that we think about this, the analogy that we use is to think about your own media audience like it's an auditorium that you own. Okay, so if you can kind of visualize that. If you can imagine kind of taking the stage in an auditorium that you own, what I want you to think about right now is how big is your email list? Okay, if you have a practice, perhaps you've been working to build an email list on your website. If you're an individual health expert, perhaps, you know, you've got a, a network of people that you know, or you've got an email list within your, your, your actual email account that you could pull together. Maybe there's a few hundred people, but however many people on your email list, what I want you to visualize is that that's how many people you have in the seats of your auditorium. Okay, so let's, let's say for the purpose of this example, you've got a thousand people on your list. Fantastic. You're standing right now in a virtual auditorium and there's a thousand people out in the seats. It's not a bad starting point for us. But what that means when we've got an audience that's that small, <coughs> excuse me, if we wanna get a message out, what we've gotta do is we've gotta go into auditoriums that other people own to reach that audience, okay? So when you do an, in, an interview with NPR, for example, the way I want you to imagine that is you're, you're going into an auditorium that is filled to the rafters with people, millions of people in that auditorium. They've built that up over the last 50 plus years. And when you do that interview, you've got three minutes on that stage. When that interview's over and you walk off of that stage, you're going back into your auditorium. The big shift that I want to encourage you to think about as you start to consider this idea of building your authority is every interview, every speaking engagement, every opportunity on social media, we are, not, we are wanting to not only educate somebody, we're wanting to extend our interaction with that person, okay? We're wanting to siphon off as much of that NPR audience as we possibly can and drive them back over to your auditorium and get them to take a seat. Okay, so one of the things that we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides is when somebody lands on your website, it's kind of like them walking in the back door of this auditorium. They're peering down from the rafters. They're trying to make a decision. Is there anything for me to do here? The issue that many, many health providers have is that their website is set up more like a brochure or an informational website than it is the way it should be set up, which is like a media property. Okay, by definition, a brochure website, it, it provides information on the practice, it provides a, a, probably a great bio for you, it, it provides a location, a phone number, but that brochure is really set up to do one thing, and it's encourage somebody to call and set an appointment, or encourage somebody to, to actually pick up the phone and, and make a pretty big step, okay? And once I've read a brochure once, I'm typically putting it down or I'm throwing it away. If I'm not ready to call you that day, there's nothing else for me to really do. Well, the same thing goes with a brochure website. When I've been there once, if I'm not yet ready to set an appointment with you, I'm out, I'm hitting the back button in my browser. So one of the things I wanna encourage you to think about in the post new media landscape, what we've gotta do is think about your website like a media property. When I say that, what I mean is, if somebody heard you give an interview on NPR and they're interested enough in your topic area to get over to your website, but they're not ready that day to set an appointment or to learn more, what we've got to do is we've got to have a framework on your website to extend our interaction with that person. In other words, to, to get them on your email list, to be able to nurture that relationship with them. And after getting a few newsletters or after hearing your podcast or reading your blog, what we want to do is work them towards taking the kind of action we want them to take. In that previous media en environment, the previous media landscape, push marketing was where it was at, right? We would push promotion at people. And today where we are is, People are actively looking for information, my goodness, especially in the health space. And what we want to do is we want to widen your net to catch those search queries online. The bigger our email list can get, the bigger our discoverability can get, uh, the better opportunity we have to provide long-term leverage. 
uh, the last thing in that previous media environment was word of mouth took a long time. I mean, you, you had to go to a lot of dinner parties to get the message out. Um, where we are today, the best way that you can drive word of mouth is to give your patients and your audience and your fans something to talk about online, okay? When it comes to awareness of issues, when it comes to potentially life-changing content, which I see from so many of the health professionals that I talk to, there's no better way to get traction for that at scale than online. And so what does this mean for you? What, what, what does this mean in terms of just the changing media landscape? Number one is those experts who build authority, okay? So those experts who not only drive high quality earned media, but provide leverage for themselves by building an email list, what happens is you give yourself an outsized advantage, an unfair advantage over your competitors. The other big thing is the more visible you get, the more you widen your net to catch queries from major media. Uh, for the last five, client that we've had on national TV, we've taken the call from that media outlet, from a producer who found them online. The cool thing that you have in the health space is that you're in a space with credentials and experience that media are actively looking for, more than any other category that we work with. And because so few health professionals are willing to get active online, those people who do can make up a lot of ground quickly. I know a lot of the folks that Justin and I talk to feel like they're way behind. Um, you know, maybe you haven't gotten active on social media. You don't have a website yet. Um, the great news is that although you may feel behind in this health space, you're still actually ahead of the curve if you get going. So I think there's a real opportunity there as your, your audience really is looking for content right now. And so if you can build visible authority, if you can increase the speed of trust, you can create a direct connection that will work uh, for you for a long time to come. Okay, so, so let's look at step two. We understand the new media environment now. Again, rented media, earned media, owned media. It all goes back to who owns the real estate, okay? The very first impression that most people are going to have of you, whether it's a patient that you walk in the door to meet with, whether it's a potential investor, whether it's a journalist, whether it's a, a CEO that you go meet with, the first impression that person has of you doesn't happen when you walk in the door for that appointment. It happens online well before that, that appointment happens. As Justin mentioned earlier, your brand is what Google says it is, okay? And so understanding that your brand is what Google says it is, it's incredibly important to know what does Google say my brand is? Uh, we call this an online brand audit. So one of the things I wanna encourage you to do is to, to go to Google, to type your name in, and to get a good sense of what kind of impression are you making, okay? so. Put very simply, type your name into Google, and number one, get a sense of if I'm looking for you by name, and again, I call this a direct search. If I'm looking for you by name, can I find you online? Many health experts that I talk to have uh, a brand that is inconsistent online or have a name that is incredibly common. And so even when somebody knows your name and goes to look for you on Google, if they can't find you at that level, we have got such a fundamental problem. You're missing so many opportunities as we sit here today that that's the very first thing to deal with, okay? And it's to think about, do I have the right brand name, okay? So, for example, if your name is something like Dr. John Smith, okay, we've got a lot of Dr. John Smiths out there. And so, the odds of you owning search, in other words, when, you, when I say own search, when somebody puts your name into Google, your website being the first result or even the second result, it's pretty low when you've got a name either that you share with a famous person or that is really common. And so what Justin and I often look at in that case is does it make sense to add a middle initial or a middle name, okay? So if it's Dr. John P. Smith, we've got a lot better opportunity of owning search for that brand name. And the key thing is, once you land on the brand name, consistency across everything that you're doing, okay? So that's the name that's on your business card. That's the name that's on your practice website. That's the name that, that is on the front cover of your book, et cetera. Your authority platform is entirely driven by the clarity around your brand. And that brand, the way you're positioned, what you advocate for, your mission, it all starts with that brand name. So ensure you've got a brand name that you that you can own search for. 
Okay, the second thing to think about in terms of, of really making sure that you take advantage of your online brand audit is really looking at, okay, again, direct search, can you be found? If you can be found, fantastic. When somebody clicks through to your website, the second question to ask is, do I have a brochure website or is my website set up like a media property? In other words, am I doing the same thing the New York Times is trying to do, the same thing that um, the Wall Street Journal is trying to do, the same thing that WebMD is trying to do online, which is I'm trying to get an, a subscriber. When somebody gets to my website, if they're not ready to set an appointment, I'm trying to get them to take a seat in my auditorium. All right? So second question to ask yourself is when somebody gets through to your website, are you making the impression you want to make? Okay, the second level of an online brand audit is to go a step further and say, okay, I have no idea what your name is, but I'm looking for the best cardiologist in Austin, Texas, or I'm looking for the best brain surgeon in Louisville or whatever it may be, and start to see how you rank for an indirect search. What we're going to talk about in the next couple of slides is how to use content marketing to really widen your net, to drive more discoverability. But if you don't get this first piece right, and if we're not owning search around your specific brand name, we've got a lot of work to do. Okay. The second hey, thing Rob, to look hey, at is to un Yeah. Hey, I want to add a, add one point. I'd love to get your comment on this. Because I think for, for our healthcare providers, it's really important to, to also note that, you know, they are who Google says they are, but then secondarily, outside of owning their own direct search and focusing the indirect search, they also are who health grades and so many of these other physician rating services say they are. And, you know, right now, that's where most of our physicians tend to, to have ranking and they're relying on what information is in those other sites and what they say about them instead of taking control of that and creating their own authority profile so that they ensure that Google is saying what they want it to say. So could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I'm glad you interjected that because you're exactly right. I mean, what, what that really means, Justin, is if the first impression most people have of your brand happens on Google, when that first impression is health grades or another site, even when the reviews are good, what that means is that somebody else owns that first impression, which means they've got leverage over you, which means they've got power over you. And, and a lot of that comes back, Justin, to the importance of owning your name online. And so when I say that is, you know, drjustinbat.com or drjohnsmith.com or drrustyshelton.com and understanding that whatever your brand is, owning that URL and making sure when somebody searches your name that that URL is coming up first, followed by media coverage, followed by your books link on Amazon, followed by social media channels. And certainly health grades is probably going to be there somewhere. But when you have those kinds of assets, the, the odds that you are going to outrank and control that first impression are so much better. So, so that's exactly right, Jason. Um, so the so third step here is really responding to your audit. As I mentioned, do you need to change your name? I have a lot of people that kind of sit back in the chair and say, what, change my name? And, and really what I mean there is, do you have a brand name that is so common that others are owning it? Or do you need, to, and if so, do you need to add a middle initial or a middle name? Brand consistency is a key, key thing. So when I say brand consistency, again, if we go with Dr. John F. Smith, that needs to be your name in LinkedIn. That needs to be your name on the practice website. That needs to be your name on Twitter. Everywhere you are, that name needs to be consistent. 1%, um, 99%, or 100% really reflects back to who is your website speaking to. If you've got a brochure website, we're set up for the sub 1% of people who get there that are ready to pick up the phone and set an appointment today, okay? If we have a website that is set up for the 100%, what we have set up there is a website where, hey, if you're ready to set an appointment or you're ready to book me for a speaking engagement, fantastic. Here's the information. But the bulk of people who got to that website after that NPR interview are really interested in having a, a healthier heart are really interested in living a healthier life or, or, or focusing more on, uh, on nutrition. And so if you can give them content, if you can give them a, a lead magnet, as we'll talk about here in a couple of slides, that gives them a reason to join your email list, that means you're set up with 100%. And finally, if you, if you go onto Google and your search result, let's say your LinkedIn profile is one of the first results, and you haven't even thought about that LinkedIn profile in six or seven years, the key reality that I'm hoping or the light bulb I'm hoping goes off today 
is that LinkedIn profile might be the on-ramp for people. That might be the first impression they have of your brand. And if it's not updated, we're missing an opportunity. So going back to what Justin talked about a few minutes ago, which is one of the biggest risks or one of the biggest realities we have in the health space is that typically online review sites like health grades are owning that first impression. So one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to go to GoDaddy. And if you don't own your name, first name, last name, dot com and, and, and if you're a physician doctor first name last name dot com I want to encourage you to go to GoDaddy and reserve it today so ideally um, what I'd love to have you do and I get this question uh, from from health professionals a lot is okay should I own rusty Shelton dot com should I own dr rusty Shelton dot com should I own rusty Shelton MD dot com and the answer is let's get them all let's get all three of them it costs ten dollars a year so we want to go ahead and grab that um, the website also should really establish a look and feel for your brand, okay? For those of you who have a practice website right now that are thinking, okay, well, is this instead of my practice website? Should I do this also if I have a practice website? What happens is when you publish a book, when you're positioned as a speaker, a thought leader, an authority, it can be very helpful to have this standalone, what we call an authority brand website, in addition to the practice website. So it's, it's an add-on to what you're doing right now. And the add-on, the importance there is because we are increasingly interested in dealing with individuals, okay, and learning from individuals as opposed to what we might perceive as large generic brands, okay? And so my likelihood of following a, a health practice on Twitter or LinkedIn or reading that blog is pretty low because I think that you know, my preconceived notion is that I'm going to get marketed to. It's going to be promotional. Uh, but when I go to a website for an individual, like you're seeing Justin's uh, what we call personal brand or authority brand website on the right, what he's done on this website is he's established his mission. He's telling you a little bit about his family, his background, but he's also very clearly establishing who he is, what we call authority by association. So when you go to that website, uh, you can see very clearly this is somebody who has incredible experience in the health innovation space. This is somebody who's doing a lot of work in the sports medicine space, but he's the chair of the health practice for Forbes Books, and that Forbes brand uh, certainly does a whole lot to establish him very quickly as an authority. And so one of the things I want to encourage you to do on your website, certainly your academic background, peer-reviewed journals, all of that stuff should be there. Uh, but when I get to the homepage of your website, if one of your goals is to do more speaking, if one of your goals is to do more media, if one of your goals is to really grow your practice, what we've got to do there is we've got to very quickly and very visually establish for your audience that you are the absolute go-to authority in your space. And if you are not yet at that authority level in terms of your name, meaning something, the quickest way for us to build your authority, the quickest way for you to build your authority on that website is authority by association, okay? And I often walk through kind of three levels to this on a website. The first is when I get to that website, if I see a picture of you giving a keynote speech immediately, I associate you as a keynote speaker, which is one of the highest compliments you can get in the earned media category, right? Under that, if I've got links to media logos where it says recently featured on or recent press, and I've got Forbes there, I've got um, the Atlantic Health Channel, if I've got WebMD, if I've got Time.com, et cetera, those logos, I, I assign an irrational amount of authority to somebody who's been on the media, okay? And right under that, if I've got a 3D book uh, or a book you've written, that tells me very quickly, wow, this guy's a speaker, uh, he's been on media, he, he's somebody who's written a book, and again, establishes authority very, very quickly. The visuals piece of this, which is the second to last bullet point, text, if, if you've got somebody who's really interested, maybe they're gonna read the text, okay? But the quick brand impression, the quick authority impression happens visually, all right? And it's not just is the website designed well, it's am I seeing brands on this website that mean something to me, okay? So the second level to that personal brand website, first level is it, it needs to look good and it needs to establish great positioning. The second level is, does it have a clear call to action? So does it have a lead magnet for the audience that gets to that website that gives them a reason to take a seat in your auditorium? Again, I, I give the NPR example. Let's say at the end of an NPR interview, a thousand people 
were interested enough in what you had to say to head over your website. So fantastic. We got a thousand people that have walked in the back door of your auditorium. And what they're doing is they're peering down from the rafters. They're trying to make a decision. Is there anything for me to do here? If you have a website that's set up like a brochure, we're asking somebody to walk all the way down from the rafters to the stage immediately. Okay, so if we stick with that 1% rule, we just got 10 appointments, which is great. That's really valuable. But the other 990 people that got to your website that were interested enough in your take on cardiology to get there but are not yet ready to set an appointment, if we don't have a lead magnet set up for that group of people, we just lost 99% of the value in the time that you spent giving that interview, okay? And so what we found with the lead magnet is there's really three categories of it, okay? So the first category, lead magnet, by the way, very specifically, is how do, how do we get somebody on your email list? Uh, the first tactic that people use is click here to join my newsletter or click here to sign up for news and updates. And we found that converts at a pretty horrific rate, okay? It's just not a, an attractive enough offer to get somebody on your email list. Um, the second tactic is one I see a lot in the healthcare space, which is click here to download my free ebook or click here to download my top 10 uh, ways that you can, you know, get to better heart health in 30 days or uh, click here to download a, a white paper and ebook. So that converts a little bit better, but the last category is the one that we're seeing right now um, has more impact and more pull than any other, and that is offering what we call interactive content, so a free quiz or a free assessment. We have tested this across a lot of different clients, and what's amazing about this lead magnet is what happens when you offer a free quiz or a free assessment, it gives the site visitor something that we know is gonna be interesting to them, which is we're telling them something about themselves. We're giving them free personalized content. Um, so the, the quiz that you see on top here is what we call the narcissism test. Dr. Craig Malkin was one of our clients, and he wrote a book called Rethinking Narcissism. Really interesting book that looked at narcissism when harnessed the right way, uh, which unfortunately it rarely is, can be a big uh, predictor of success. And so he set up the narcissism test on his website and did a great job creating it. And the idea around the narcissism test was to reflect back to somebody either healthy narcissism or non-healthy narcissism? Uh, it's about 20 questions. If you go to the narcissismtest.com, you can take it. Uh, but we've had more than 160,000 people take that test. And so very practically, if you think about this, when Dr. Malkin gets to the end of an interview or when he writes an article for Forbes, at the bottom of that article, instead of encouraging somebody to go buy his book, like most authors do, I mean, certainly if they're ready to do that, sure, there's the, there's the link to do it. But his primary call to action is, are you curious? If you are a healthy narcissist, click here to take my free narcissism test. And what happens is he moves a lot of that 990 people, a lot of them take a seat in his auditorium, as I mentioned. So what I wanna encourage you to think about in your topic area is, is there an assessment or a quiz that you could offer up on your website that's an entry point that gives you an opportunity not just to get somebody on your email list, but more importantly, for those of you who are really in this to make an impact, which are the ones we're interested in working with, this is one of the best opportunities for education. When you give somebody an assessment and you reflect back on them where they are right now at a, at a basic level, again, we're not trying to diagnose anybody with a quiz or an assessment. We're trying to give them quick informal feedback. But what happens is when, when somebody takes this narcissism test, whatever category they fall in, there's an email that goes out from Dr. Malkin that explains the category that they're in and gives them some tips or some ways that they can start working to a more positive revol resolution of that. So um, consider that as a call to action. Again, we're finding a lot of success with using quizzes and assessments to not only drive awareness and engagement online, but to build those email lists. Um, so step six is really around uh, having a dynamic blog, okay? And I have a lot of people when you know, when I talk to them about, all right, step one is to create a great website with the right kind of lead magnet, which is an assessment. Step two, in terms of priority, is you've got to have a good blog. I have a lot of people that say, really, it, you know, is blogging really still the thing after all of these years? And yes, it is still the thing. There's two big reasons why blogging is the thing. Number one is it gives your website fresh, resourceful content, okay? Google, right now, the way that Google returns search results 
uh, is driven largely by two things. Number one, is the website updated? Is it something that has fresh content on a routine basis? What that tells Google is this is not a brochure, this is more of a media property, which Google has judged as a more valuable result. The second way that they judge search results is based on link backs. How many people are sharing links to your website? How many people are talking about your website on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn? And the more other people linking to your content, the more Google views you as, uh, as a valuable search result to return. The second big reason though that I want to encourage you guys to think about having a blog on your website is a great blog is a great relationship builder. It's a way to involve other people in what you're doing. And so it really allows you to build a voice and loyalty. Uh, and, and when we think about the right content strategy on a blog, and, and I always encourage people uh, when Justin and I are talking to them to really think about, you know, a good blog is kind of like your newspaper. Okay, so a good blog is your newspaper. What most people do on a blog is they either fill their newspaper with ads or they fill it with op-eds. In other words, it's only your stuff again and again. And what we have found is that if you've got a thousand people in your auditorium and you're only giving them your stuff from the stage, it's a slow grind. It is really a slow growth curve. And those of you, my guess is if you try to blog in the past and I've seen a couple of comments from people who are, you know, mentioning, hey, I haven't had a whole lot of success with a blog up to now. I understand it's not uncommon for me to hear that. My guess is what you have done in the past is you have only given out your IP. In other words, you've only written about your stuff, and it's a slow grind until you're an authority, until the auditorium is full, where people know to pay attention to you. So we recommend a three-part content strategy. Uh, the first category is newsjacking. So taking the, the latest research, the latest stories, the latest high-profile issues in your topic area and writing about those. I mentioned earlier in this presentation that journalists increasingly are proactively looking for experts online, especially in the health space. When you're writing about the stories that they're actually looking for online, you really ramp up your opportunity to drive inbound publicity opportunities. Um, the second category is evergreen. These are really your op-eds, three ways to improve your heart health, four foods that uh, you should eat you know, each week to improve your heart health, things like that that are more timeless. Uh, and then the last category is one of my favorites. If you're just getting started building your authority, building your platform, wanting to get out and speak and write books in your topic area, one of the best things you can do is use your blog as a relationship building tool, okay? Instead of being like every other author or every other person who's trying to get something from somebody, instead flip it around. And when you think like the media, part of that is involving others in what you're doing, all right? A newspaper is not just op-ed content, it's journalists interviewing other people. And so when you start an interview series, sticking with heart health, if we do it on the heart health topic, when you involve others, other people who are writing books in this space, speaking in this space, doing research in this space, et cetera, not only do you give yourself a way to build relationships with them, uh, but you also, every time one of those interviews runs and they share it on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter or on their email list, they're helping you to drive traffic into your auditorium. Uh, so that is what I think of as an owned media blog. The other thing that, that we've had a lot of success with in the health space, and I would encourage you to think about, is what we call a third-party blog. So a third-party blog or an earned media blog is where you're writing a column on a, on a media website. It could be Psychology Today. It could be Huffington Post. It could be the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic.com, the health section there. It could be Forbes. Um, when you have an earned media blog, going back to our auditorium analogy, and let's say you're writing for Forbes. Forbes, the, the network across Forbes properties, I think it's over 90 million um, readers that they reach through that ecosystem, 90 million people. So when you are writing for Forbes, you, it's almost like you've got a little sliver of that stage in their auditorium. And our goal, of course, with each of those articles is, number one, to make an impact, to educate, so to entertain and inform. Number two is to siphon off as much of that audience as possible and drive them back to our auditorium, to your owned media space where they can join your email list. And so that call to action at the end is where, you know, that piece of it happens and why that's so important. The other thing I want you to think about is just a mindset of using what we think of as rented media or social media as a relationship building tool. Okay, so 
one of the great things about social media, and I have, by the way, a lot of the health audiences that I talk to come in really with their guard up around social media, and, and I understand why. Um, not only do we have to think about uh, HIPAA, not only do we have to think about all of the different missteps and, and all the things that we see in terms of just uh, challenges, let's say, that, that physicians and others in the health space have had in social media from complaining about patients on Facebook to, um, you know, to, to off-color remarks on Twitter. There have been plenty of examples of things going wrong. There are many more examples that you never hear about of things going really well within social media, of an impact being made within a social media. We know, according to Pew, 61% of Americans look online for health information. 41% of those patients have read somebody else's commentary or experience. Um, and, and it's really important that we understand 41% of consumers say that info that they found on social media uh, affects the decisions that they make in terms of healthcare. So it, it's a place not only people are paying attention, but it's translating to action. Okay, so when we think about an impact on your message, it's an important place to be. What we found with social media is it's, it's less a place about going direct to patients, although there will be that opportunity. What we have found is that the, the bigger upside, perhaps, of social is the opportunity to build relationships with those who do impact patients. So journalists, influencers, um, you know, potential opportunities for you to speak, what we've called here biz dev targets of, you know, conferences or organizations or, or you know, uh, corporations where you could go in and really make an impact. So focus on relationship building as well on platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And certainly there's, there's a lot more to talk about here, but the mindset I wanna encourage you to have in rented media is one around relationship building as opposed to keynote speaking, okay? A lot of physicians get on social and they think that they're just there to, to, to preach and, and to, to, um, to go out and just give information. And, and that's one piece of it, but the bigger mindset in terms of success is the opportunity to pull people to you by building relationships. Uh, the ninth step, so cu a couple last, last two steps that I wanna walk through here, then I wanna throw it back to Justin um, to, to talk a little bit about kind of where to go from here. Um, but step nine is leverage the power of, of data mining. Um, so data, one of the cool things that we have right now in the online space is we've got more access to data than we've ever had before. If you go onto Twitter, by the way, and you go to the search field and you type in cardiology, or you type in brain surgery, or you type in physiatry, whatever your, your specific focus may be, you're going to be amazed at all of the results that come up of all of your colleagues that are already on Twitter having active conversations there. ABC News, uh, Dr. Richard Besser, who's the health correspondent there, does a weekly chat on a different topic. Some weeks it's uh, skin cancer. Some weeks he's looking at obesity. And so that live chat, I've seen the Mayo Clinic there. I've seen uh, you know, Harvard Medical School physicians there. There's a lot going on on Twitter. And the only way for you to access it is to understand the power of data mining. By the way, if you've written an article in the past, whether it's for Huffington Post or the Chicago Tribune or wherever it may be, um, if you haven't been on Twitter, what I encourage you to do, and this is going to really surprise you, but if you go on Twitter and you type in the name of the article that you wrote in the search field and you search that, it'll pull up a stream of all of the people who shared that article, what they said about it. And one of the most eye-opening things that I see from people is when they go and do that, just the amount of people who are having a conversation about your content that you never knew was happening, uh, oftentimes will really prove out the power of social media. Uh, in the last step, you know, we talked a lot about text content today, uh, but the other opportunity is really diversifying your content. Again, guys, this goes back to this idea of thinking more like the media than a marketer, okay? And so when we think about media, there's really four forms of media, okay? There's text, there are visuals, there's audio, and there's video, okay? And so we've got an opportunity really to go across each of these. Text, I believe, is the foundation because Google and search is still really the foundation of search is text. Uh, but one area that I've seen a lot of physicians have a lot of success with is podcasting. So podcasting is an area that is what we think of as like a hockey stick of growth up. In other words, it's, it's really the audience uh, and the number of people listening to podcasts is dramatically rising. And the number of people who are creating podcasts or creating the content is also rising, but not at the same level. 
And so there's a real opportunity there. And, and a good podcast really combines what we've talked about with the interview series on your blog. Uh, if you do that via a podcast, it can, it can kill two birds with one stone. Um, so I do encourage you, as you think about content streams, think about what really aligns with the audience you're trying to reach, but also with what you enjoy. If you're not really a writer, um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have text because certainly you could pair up with a ghostwriter. Um, but if you're not really a writer, if speaking is really your thing, maybe the podcast is, is, is one of the first things that you start with or social video, live Facebook video where, um, you know, you're providing some insights. So think about opportunities to diversify your content. If you are thinking about a podcast, but you've never listened to podcasts before, I encourage you go online, listen to a few as examples. Um, I've actually got a podcast called Upside, the business growth podcast. I've had a few of our health members or clients on there, and, and, and that may be a good one for you to look at alongside uh, some others from Rory Vaden or Dave Ramsey or Tim Ferriss or, or many others. So that may, may be another uh, great place to look. But, you know, Justin, I think the, the big thing that I wanted to get across to our audience today, especially in the health space, I talked to so many health professionals that feel like Number one, they're way behind. Number two, it, it's a space that is so scary or so regulated on the health side that they don't want to make a mistake, which is certainly a perspective that I understand. But, you know, we know from experience, if you approach it the right way and you approach it with a, really a more of a missional focus or cause focus, as opposed to, you know, some kind of a me first brand or a me first, you know, authority platform, you're going to be so much more successful. And more importantly, for, for really what we're trying to do, you're going to make a much bigger impact with your message. So uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities to, to do that. And I don't know if there's anything else you throw in on, on that piece, but I think these are really the 10 steps that, you know, that our audience today needs to, needs to walk through. Whew, Rusty, that was incredible. I mean, I hope that those of you listening were taking copious notes and scribbling this down. And if you need to re-listen to this, um, we'll do more sessions coming up. So sign up if you need to watch that again, because that was like a fire hose on authority marketing, Rusty, and and really so much value in that. So thank you for your time and for your contribution. And I, I'm quite confident that that helps a lot of our healthcare members out there and really position them well to understanding this new media economy that we're all operating in. And, you know, Rusty, you kind of said it there at the end. And I think that a lot of this goes back to the fact that there are going to be people that jump in this game and you know it's it's why not have the right people become the right authorities that should be that in their local geography regional geography or even national slash international geography and take advantage of that and i think the key goes back to what you said last and that is you know if you approach this with an open hand and you provide value to your audience value to your patients value to those consuming your content then it'll flow back into your hand in terms of either new patients or revenue or whatever that is that you're looking to, to do that missional focus. But if you approach this with a closed hand where it's all about you, it's all about ego, it's all about you know, being centric around your, your, your brand in a, in a negative way, then that's not going to happen and the market just won't bear out. So I think you laid a clear groundwork for that, Rusty, and I really thank you for that and, and for your time and, and your amazing contribution. Well, my pleasure, Justin. I hope it was helpful. Absolutely. So, you know, why don't we do this, Rusty? Let's, let's take our folks through what these next steps will be and, and how we recommend that you, you really look at the path towards becoming a healthcare authority. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. said that you don't have to see the whole staircase. You just have to take the first step. So what is that first step to being an authority? I think, you know, another favorite quote of mine, Andy Stanley says that direction, not intention, determines destination. And really it's about understanding where you are and where you want to go and what you need to do to get there. That's ultimately going to arrive at you becoming an authority in the healthcare space. So what Rusty and I have done is we have created a healthcare authority assessment for you all. Rusty talked about the power of an assessment. And we've got one for you to take, and it will literally lay out where you are on the scale of, of being a healthcare authority and where you're ranked and what you need to do to move up to the next level. So you can take that on my personal brand website at justinbat, 
with two Ts.com slash authority assessment. So justinbat.com slash authority assessment. Go there, take the quiz, and find out where you rank currently in terms of that authority. And then use what Rusty conveyed to help build yourself out and become the authority in the healthcare space. And as you look to begin that authority journey and you think about what we've talked about today, I'd ask you to, to look at yourself and, and use the readiness ruler and assess where you are. So based on what we talked about today, are you ready to become a healthcare authority? Are you at the stage where you want to publish a book, where you want to have help positioning yourself and having Rusty and, and myself and others really support you and be a guide to move you towards that authority journey? If you are, then you're an eight, nine, or 10, and you're ready to take action and you're ready to go. If you're somewhat unsure, you like the content, you've learned a lot today, but you're still a bit trepid in terms of where I go next or, or how you put this all together, then you're a four, five, six, or seven. And if you're just, frankly, you're like, this is too much for me, I'm just not ready, I'm not sure that this is the path that I need to take, then you're a zero, one, two, or three. And so what we've done is we've laid out a, a plan for each of you, depending upon where you are on this scale. So if you're a one through a three, that you're just not ready at this point, then why don't you request a free copy of my book that I've co-authored with our CEO of Advantage Forbes Books, Adam Witte, called Lead the Field for Health Professionals. And if you email me at jbat at forbesbooks.com, again, jbat at forbesbooks.com, with your mailing address and say, hey, I saw the webinar. Justin, I'd love to get a free copy of the book. I'll put that in the mail to you at no charge to you. I'll even cover the shipping. And if, if you really feel like you benefited a lot from what Rusty said and you specifically request Mastering the New Media Landscape, um, I'll see if I can't pop that in there for you too and really give you a one-two punch. So those are both great foundational tools foundational resources for, again, understanding what it takes to be a leader in the field of healthcare and embracing that new micromedia mindset in this new media landscape that we're operating in. So again, one through three, email me, jbat at ask for the books, and I'll get them right out to you. If you're further on that scale and you're just not sure at this point, then you can see I've placed the bat phone there. So pick up the phone and let's have an authority marketing audit call. Take the assessment on my website, and then let's have a call and discuss the results and where you are and put a plan together mutually that we can focus on how to get you to that next stage. So again, email me at jbat at forbesbooks.com, jbat at forbesbooks.com, and we can conduct a call, 30 minutes or so, assess your results in the assessment, and put together a mutually beneficial plan to move you to the next level. And again, Happy to send you the books if you'd like those too. So just include that in your email. Well, now if you watch this and you're like, Justin, I'm ready to go. I've got an idea for a book, which by the way, is where most people come to us at that stage, just with an idea or, or a loose framework. You know, less than 5% of the people we work with have a manuscript at this point because of time and opportunity costs, right? That's why you haven't written a book yet. And so if, if you're at the stage where you're like, I'm ready to go, I just, how do I start? I want you to say that, that much like in healthcare, we like to do an assessment before we just prescribe anything. And so the first step for that assessment is really to, to do an outline creation call. And I would match you up with one of our, our great project editors in house. In about two hours over the phone, they would download the content out of your head, get it onto paper, record it, transcribe it, and then spend about a week really building out a robust outline for your book. And we can make that happen fairly quickly. And that's a great framework to build a foundation for uncovering the, the opportunity to publish in the book process. And let me just say, you know, if, the, if you're thinking about publishing a book and it seems like a daunting task, we've worked with over a couple thousand authors in the last decade, many of them health professionals, and most of them invest less than 24 hours of their time in the publishing process. You're gonna ask me how we do that. I can't reveal it here on the call. We give away our trade secrets, um, but I promise you it, it's been an efficient and effective process. And if you email me at jbat at say, hey, Justin, I'm interested in, in doing the Fast Start Author Program and creating my outline for my book, then we can work on, on getting that taken care of and getting you matched up with the project editor. 
And then you've got another option. If you want a more of a hands-on approach, we can do the outline, but you also more than welcome to come visit myself in Charleston, South Carolina, in the Holy City, number one travel destination in the world by Condé Nast, several years in a row now. So not a lot of, not a lot of pull to get you here to Charleston, but you can come take part in our Authority Marketing Institute. And that's where Rusty and I would, would sit down with you and a couple of other expert colleagues to really build out an authority marketing blueprint. That's a 12 month authority marketing plan for both your book and that authority marketing component of both your brand and your, your practice or your business. And you leave the day with not only a great outline and the concept for your book, but the authority marketing blueprint that really lays out your mission, your big why, those seven pillars of branding and a very comprehensive plan for how you become an authority in your space. So if that's something you're interested in, you want to come visit us in Charleston, then email me at jbatforsbooks.com and say, hey, I want to do an authority marketing day in Charleston and we can talk about dates and, and get that set up. It is a completely red carpet experience. We put you up at a fabulous hotel downtown. We take care of your food the night before at a great restaurant and all your costs while you're here in town. In terms of transportation and logistics, you're just responsible for your flight or drive into Charleston, and the fee for the day is $3,500, which we do credit towards your book or marketing project should you go forward. And, and just, I failed to mention, the cost of the outline is $1,500 if you choose to do the outline. And again, credited towards your, your book project. The, uh, the Blueprint Day includes both of those, and we'll credit that towards your project if you go forward. So those are really the, the next steps that you can take. If, if you want to request a book, email me. If you'd like to have a phone consult call and go through your assessment together and build that plan, we can do that. And then lastly, if you're ready to produce the book, let's get your outline built. Or if you want to visit us in Charleston, we'd love to have you here to host you and conduct that Authority Marketing Blueprint Day. So with that, I want to say thank you for joining us. It has been a real pleasure. I love talking to other folks in healthcare. It's been a great having Rusty here involved. You know, Rusty, you always bring your A game. You did again today. I appreciate that. I look forward to the next uh, webinar that we do together, which will be coming up soon. So please pass this on to friends, other colleagues that you think would benefit from it. Have them sign up for a future webinar. Reach out to either myself. My information is there below on the screen on the left. Rusty's information is there on the right if you'd like to, have to re reach out to him. And we just can't thank you enough for your time, for the opportunity to help you change your life, your business, your practice, and ultimately for all of us to change this healthcare in, the, in this country by making a difference together collaboratively and collectively. Russ, anything you want to add here at the end? No, I think you, I think you nailed it right there, Justin. I, I really appreciate everybody who's uh, you know, been sitting through and hopefully uh, learning a lot from this webinar. And as you mentioned, I think there are a few different ways that uh, we can try to take this forward. A lot of people I know after hearing a conference or hearing a webinar, you know, stuff sounds good, they're excited, but they aren't sure where to go from here. So I think you laid out some good options, as you mentioned, you know, both of our contact information is there. If you want to, you know, if you have a website, you want to take a quick look at it, give you some feedback. If you've got uh, a book concept, you're not sure really has potential, you know, feel free to utilize us for that. You know, we're, we're both very passionate, especially in the health space, about empowering physicians, empowering people who have a message that can really make a positive impact. And so if we can help there, you know, please let us know. But Justin, sure appreciate, uh, you know, the, the opportunity here to, to partner up with you on this. And um, I'll look forward to doing it again soon. Thanks, Rusty. Well, to sign off, I'll leave you with this. In the words of Seth Godin, the great marketer, Instead of wondering when your next vacation is, set up a life you don't need to escape from. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you watching, and we will talk to you soon. Take care.